Hello and welcome to National Fire Biology Unit 1 Key Area 4 Proteins and Enzymes. We're currently still on Unit 1 Cell Biology and we're now over halfway through this unit now moving on to proteins and enzymes. You should have already covered key areas 1 to 3 and if not please go back and watch those lessons again before moving on. As usual, I highly recommend looking at the National Fire Biology course specification or mandatory knowledge document. Remember the first two columns detail everything that you could be asked in the tests or exams at this level, so it's important to come back to this and make sure you understand everything prior to those assessments. In this lesson, our learning intention is to learn about proteins and enzymes. More specifically, by the end of the lesson, you should be able to explain how different proteins are produced, state the five types of protein, describe the function and properties of enzymes, describe why enzymes are referred to as specific, and explain the effects of changing temperature or pH on enzyme activity. First, we're going to look at the different types of protein. The first key point is that the shape of proteins is essential. Their shape allows them to carry out their specific function, and their shape and functions are therefore determined by the sequence of the subunits that make them up, in this case, amino acids. If you don't remember how genes made of DNA code for different proteins, please go back and watch the lesson on K-Area 3 DNA. Proteins have different functions within plants and animals, and these functions can be split into five main types. Structural, hormones, antibodies, receptors, and enzymes. Structural proteins are found in places like your skin, hair and nails, and protect various parts of your body, or are found in the structures of cells. Hormones are chemical messengers which travel through the blood to their target organs, and we'll come back to these and do a whole topic on them in Unit 2. Antibodies, again, will be covered in more detail later in the course, and these are produced by lymphocytes, white blood cells, in your immune system in order to fight infectious pathogens. Receptors um, are proteins that are found on a cell membrane and can bind to things like hormones. And finally, enzymes speed up chemical reactions. Now, it's really important that you know the five types, and a way to help you remember them is the mnemonic SHARE, so S-H-A-R-E. Structural, hormone, antibody, receptor and enzyme. And if you remember that, that should help you in your tests or exam. So we'll cover four of these proteins and other topics, but from now on, Karia 4 focuses specifically on our last type, which is enzymes. So the first thing you need to know about enzymes are their five main properties, and we'll go through these now one at a time. First, you already know that enzymes are a type of protein. So they're made from protein and therefore are made of amino acids. Secondly, the main function of enzymes is they're what we call biological catalysts. You may have heard the term catalyst before, either in chemistry, or you may have heard the term catalytic converter, if you know a bit about cars. Catalysts speed up chemical reactions. And we call enzymes biological catalysts as they speed up chemical reactions within living things. So remember, bio in biology means living. So enzymes being biological catalysts speed up chemical reactions in living things. And this is really important as without enzymes, living things would not be able to survive. The key chemical reactions in our bodies that help us continue to live would not be able to take place at a quick enough pace without enzymes being there to speed them up. So because of this, we come on to property number three. They are made by all living cells. We're already covered the fact that they speed up cellular reactions, chemical reactions that happen in cells. But another thing that makes enzymes so amazing is that they actually remain unchanged within that process. So you can use them over and over and over again and the reactions they take place in don't change them. Finally, they're specific to their substrate. Now, before we can explain this, I need to introduce to you what substrates are and what specificity is as well. So before we move on to look in more detail at enzymes and their substrates, let's try some quick questions. So pause the video here and try these questions on a piece of paper or by saying the answers out loud, and then play the video when you're ready for the answers. Okay. So question number one was name the five main roles or functions of proteins. Structural, hormone, antibody receptors, and enzymes. So share. So remember to remember that mnemonic and it'll help you remember your five types. Number two was what was the subunit of proteins? We should know this from our previous topic. So it's amino acids. And finally, it was to give at least one fact or property about enzymes. So we know quite a few from our last slide. So they are biological catalysts. They're found in all living cells. They're made of proteins. They remain unchanged after taking part in reactions. And they speed up cellular reactions as well. So any one of those is fine. But by the end of this topic, you do need to know them all. 
Okay, so we're now going to look more closely at enzyme reactions. Enzyme reactions always have the following structure. So substrates at the start and substrates of the molecule the enzyme works on. The enzyme in the reaction goes above the arrow and the products go at the end. The products are product or products and being the molecules are produced at the end of an enzyme reaction. So substrate, enzyme, product. My first tip in this is that you, this is how you should be setting out all of your enzyme diagrams and equations. My second tip for this is the enzyme must go above the arrow. It does not go beside the substrate. A lot of people write substrate plus and then their enzyme. That's incorrect. And that's because this enzyme remains unchanged and can be used again in the reaction. It's not used up. If you put plus the enzyme here, it would mean the enzyme is used up to make the product, which is not the case. The enzyme's unchanged and can be used again, so it goes above the arrow. So now if you look in a little bit more detail at enzyme reactions, this diagram represents what an enzyme reaction would look like. It's really important that you're able to describe the stages of an enzyme reaction as this could be a possible extended response question in a test or exam. So here I have a diagram illustrating the process and also a description underneath which I'll explain step by step. You should be able to describe this in words and be able to label a diagram like this one if it was given to you. So in stage one, in the diagram, the substrate which is this thing here, binds to the enzyme, and this is a point on the enzyme called the active site. Remember, the active site is on the enzyme and is not found on the substrate. The shape of the enzyme's active site is complementary to its specific substrate. So remember we mentioned complementary when we previously discussed DNA bases. Complementary means they fit together. So here this means the active site has a shape that fits with its complementary substrate. You can see that here, that they have the same shape, they fit together. An enzyme only binds with one substrate because only one substrate has that correct shape to fit into the enzyme's active site. And this is why we describe enzymes as being specific. And remember that was the fifth property of enzymes I mentioned earlier. Once the substrate binds to the active site of the enzyme, it forms something called an enzyme substrate complex. So this thing here, which are both where they're both joined together, and this facilitates the reaction that then takes place. Finally, the action or activity of the enzyme results in products being produced and then being released from the enzyme's active site. So we had substrate, we had our substrate enzyme complex, and then we had our products being made. Now, one thing to notice here is once the product leaves the active site of the enzyme, the enzyme is back to the exact same shape that it was at the start of the reaction. Remember, it remains unchanged, and this is now ready to go back to the start and bind another substrate and do this whole reaction again and again. Now, before we move on, here are some true or false questions on what we've covered so far. Again, these are really common in tests or exams, and you'll usually find them in table form. You should select true or false for each one, and then really importantly, if it's false, you have to give the one word that would be used to replace the underlined word to make the statement correct. A lot of people forget to either put the word and lose their mark, or you rewrite the whole sentence again, which is not required. So true or false, pause the video for each one, and then if it's false, make sure you tell me what word should replace the one that's underlined to make it correct. So pause the video here, try the true or false questions, and play when you're ready for the answers. Okay, so number one, enzymes are proteins. That's true. Number two, enzymes are catalysts. Again, it's true, although it would be better here to say it's biological catalysts instead of just catalysts. But they've underlined the word catalyst by itself, so it's fine just being catalyst. Number three, the shape of an enzyme is critical to its function. That's true. Remember, if the shape of an enzyme isn't correct, it won't be able to bind the substrate. Four, an enzyme shape is determined by the sequence of carbohydrates in its structure. That's false. It's not carbohydrates, it's um, amino acids. So amino acids, remember, make up the protein which makes up the enzyme. Um, so it's the amino acid sequence, which is really important for the shape. Number five, enzymes are non-specific. That's also false, and my correction would be specific. So enzymes are specific. Number six, enzymes are changed in reactions. Again, that's false. They remain unchanged in reactions. So now we know the stages of an enzyme reaction, we're going to look at the types of enzyme reactions. Now there's two types of enzyme reactions and we call them degradation and synthesis reactions. 
Equations for both of them, which I'll use as an example, still follow the structure I mentioned earlier, so still go substrate enzyme product. So first we're going to look at degradation reactions. This is our first type of enzyme reaction and involves enzymes breaking larger molecules down into smaller molecules. You can see that in the diagram below. We have a single large substrate over here binding to the enzyme's active site, forming the enzyme substrate complex, and then the two products being released are smaller than the original substrate was. So a larger molecule has been broken down into smaller molecules through a degradation reaction. You also need to be able to know and recognise examples of degradation reactions. These are the four most common ones that come up in assessments and again all of the equations follow the same structure, so substrate enzyme product. In our first example the substrate is starch and it is broken down by the enzyme amylase to produce the product maltose. The way to remember this example is SAM, starch, amylase, maltose. In our second most common example, um, the substrate in question is hydrogen peroxide. Most of you will probably have heard this in terms of using it to bleach your hair. It's actually a toxic chemical that's produced by cells. So cells have an enzyme inside them called catalase, which can break this toxic hydrogen peroxide down into the harmless chemicals, oxygen and water as products. And the way to remember this example is HP cow. So those first two are the most common, but you'll also see these last two in past papers as well. So in our third example, the substrate is fats, and we have an enzyme called lipase, which can break the fats down in to produce the products fatty acid and glycerol. And finally, we have the last substrate, which is protein, and it can be broken down by the enzyme pepsin into its subunit product, which we know is amino acids. So these are all examples of degradation reactions. So all the substrates on the left-hand side are larger molecules and they're broken down by the enzymes into the smaller molecules on the right. One final thing to notice about these examples is that in most cases, you can recognize the name of an enzyme by its ending. Most enzymes end in ASE or A's. So even if you haven't heard of a protein before um, or an enzyme before, you should be able, sorry, to pick it out um, by the fact that it has that A's at the end of it. The only anomaly here is pepsin, which doesn't follow that rule. So lipase, catalase, amylase, all enzymes, so are enzymes. Pepsin is also an enzyme, though it just doesn't follow the general rule. Now, before we move on from degradation, here's a bigger picture illustration of a degradation reaction to try and help you picture it. So starch is a very large molecule made up of many glucose molecules. The glucose molecules are these little hexagons here. Um, and starch is found in a lot of foods that we eat, such as bread, pasta and potatoes. Our body needs to break the starch down to be able to absorb it. Um, so our saliva contains an enzyme called amylase. Amylase breaks down the starch in a degradation reaction to make maltose. And as you can see here, the maltose molecules are much, much smaller than the big, large starch molecule. And so this can now be absorbed into our intestines and then used for energy. So now we're leaving degradation reactions behind and moving on to our second type of enzyme reaction, which is called synthesis reactions. Synthesis reactions are the opposite of degradation reactions and they involve enzymes building up smaller molecules into larger ones. Again, you can see this in the diagram here. This time there's a couple of smaller substrates on the left hand side that bind to the enzyme's active site, forming the enzyme substrate complex. And when the product is released from the enzyme, it's larger than the smaller substrates at the start. Now there's only one example of synthesis reactions that you need to know. It's only this example that comes up and that is glucose 1-phosphate is a substrate being built up by the enzyme phosphorylase to make the larger product starch and you can remember it G1PPS for this one. Now here's a diagram to help illustrate this happening. So there's very small glucose molecules on the right hand side and these are the left hand side and these are joined together by the enzyme phosphorylase to make a very large molecule of starch. Now, before we move on to the final section of this topic, let's try another set of quick questions. As usual, pause the video here and try the questions, then play when you're ready to go over the answers. Okay, so question number one is what is an enzyme? An enzyme is a biological catalyst. Question number two is what, is en what are enzymes made of? They're made of proteins. For number three, what word is used to describe a reaction that breaks a molecule down? That's a degradation reaction. 
What words do you use to describe a reaction that builds up smaller molecules or substances to make more complex or larger ones? Would be a synthesis reaction. Number five, name the place where a substrate binds to an enzyme. Should be the active site. And number six, acid enzymes can be reused. And the answer is yes, because they remain unchanged. So enzymes speed up chemical reactions, but these reactions can happen at different speeds and this is affected by factors that can alter an enzyme's activity. So each enzyme is most active at what we call its optimum set of conditions. One thing to point out here is it's no longer okay to say that an enzyme's optimum is where it works best. You now need to say instead that it is where the enzyme is most active or where an enzyme is at its fastest rate of activity. Enzymes and other proteins, remember, can be affected by two different factors, temperature and pH, and we're going to look at each of these now in more detail. So starting with temperature, you will often see enzyme temperature graphs with this characteristic shape. In particular, this graph allows you to find out an enzyme's optimum temperature, as we know the optimum is where the enzyme's rate of activity is highest, so we just go to the highest point on the graph, the maximum activity, we go straight down from here and we can read off the optimum temperature if the graph had numbers on the x-axis. Now it's really essential that you're able to describe this graph in detail and this is another case where this could be a three or four mark extended response question in an assessment. So here's how I would suggest describing it. Firstly, as the temperature increases from zero degrees Celsius, the enzyme activity, which is on the y-axis here, also increases until it reaches the optimum temperature for the enzyme. Then I would point out that the optimum temperature is where the enzyme is most active or its rate of activity is highest, which is what we saw in the graph here. Next part is where most people start to go wrong. So we need to say that as the temperature increases past the optimum, so as the temperature increases past the optimum, then the enzyme activity decreases. Never say that the enzyme denatures at temperatures above optimum, that's not correct. Instead, as the temperature increases past the optimum, um, the enzyme activity decreases. Then finally, you can say eventually that at very high temperatures, the enzyme denatures. And we can see that on the graph, the enzyme activity reaches zero or almost zero at this stage here. So it's really important that you can describe this, so please take a note of these stages or rewind and go back through this again. Another key thing to point out is that different enzymes have different optimum temperatures. Although human enzymes have a temperature, optimum temperature of around 37 degrees Celsius, a lot of people wrongly assume that every enzyme has this optimum temperature and that's not the case. If you think about an enzyme like phosphorylase that we saw before as our synthesis example that's found in potatoes that grow in the ground, it wouldn't make sense for that enzyme to work at its highest rate at 37 degrees, which is human body temperature, because it's in potatoes instead. So remember not to say the optimum is 37 degrees unless you were told it in the question. So as we saw in the graph, if an enzyme reaches a very high temperature, it will denature. Denaturing is when the enzyme's active site changes shape, as we can see in this diagram here. And we know from looking at enzyme reactions before that the problem with the active site changing shape is that the active site shape is really important because it's specific to that enzyme specific substrate. So if the active site changes shape, then the enzyme substrates can no longer bind to the active site of the enzyme and therefore the enzyme can no longer take part in the reaction and speed up. So pH is another factor that can affect an enzyme's activity. Each enzyme also has an optimum pH, and this is the pH where an enzyme is most active or works at its highest rate of activity. This graph below shows enzyme activity up the side, just like in the temperature graph, but this time it has pH going along the bottom and the pH runs from zero up to 14. Most enzymes have an optimum pH around neutral, so neutral is pH 7, and this graph shows the highest enzyme activity for general enzymes, which is this pink line here, being around pH 8. However, there are exceptions to this. So for example, in this graph of pH and enzyme activity, the enzyme pepsin, which is an enzyme that's found in the stomach, has an optimum pH of 2. Whereas the enzyme trypsin, which is found in the small intestine, has an optimum pH of 8. And you'll also notice they have different ranges. So pepsin has a range of between 0 and 4, whereas trypsin has a range between about 5.5 and 10. 
So these ranges do not overlap, which means that trypsin, if you took it and put it in the conditions that pepsin is in, would not function. This enzyme would not function properly. Its rate of activity is zero at these pHs. So remember, not all enzymes have the same optimum pHs or the same temperatures. So before we finish up, here's a final set of quick questions that are true or false answers. Remember, for the ones you determine to be false, you must give the word you would add in place of the underlying word to make the statement true. Pause the video here and try these questions and play again when you're ready. OK, so let's go through the answer. So number one says enzymes are made of carbohydrates. We know that's false. Enzymes are made of proteins. Starch breaks down hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water. Again, we know that's false. Catalase is the enzyme that breaks down hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water. Remember HP cow, it wasn't starch. For number three, the optimum is the name given to the conditions in which an enzyme is at its most active. That's true. Number four, temperature and sunlight are two factors which affect enzyme activity. That's false. Sunlight isn't a factor that I've said affects the enzyme activity. It should be temperature and pH. In today's lesson, we've learned about Kyria 4, proteins and enzymes. I hope you now feel confident in these areas, and if not, you can always come back and watch those sections of the video again. I hope you found the lesson useful, and thank you again for watching.